Greetings and welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic. I am your host, Ted Flanagan, and I'm joined today by Wichter Dodder. He's the CEO of Z Beyond. We're going to be talking about optimizing materials in the drivetrains of electric vehicles. Okay, uh, greetings, Wichter. How are you today? Hi, Ted. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great, too. And you're, you're in Sweden as we speak, right? Exactly. South of Sweden. The sun is just coming out after the winter again. So it's, it's a good time here in Sweden. How was, how was your winter this year? It was um, eventful in the business since we launched our company in December. And uh, our kids are, are six and four years old. So they're in a, a good sweet spot right now. So, so less eventful on the private side. <laughs> but all in all, very good, yeah. Your life, life is full, huh? And, and I know that, uh, you know, Sweden, just like northern Vermont, where I used to live, you know, you hunker down for the winter, right? And then the spring, yeah. then the sun comes out and it's, it's just the most wonderful thing of all. When yeah, spring... moving here from, from Germany, um, I thought the darkness would be the, the most difficult thing, but it was really the people disappearing because of the darkness that was the most difficult thing. Empty streets after 4 p.m. was nothing I was used to. Yeah. And then, and then they again in the spring they come out like uh, like flowers, yeah. crocuses coming out of the snow. Exactly. So, well, very good. Now, um, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about your what you're working on right now, and then we'll back up and talk a little bit more about your life. But you're the CEO of Z Beyond, and what is Z Beyond's mission? Yeah, good. Um, Sibion's mission is to embed circularity aspects in the early stage product development R&D. And, and we do that because uh, a lot of large industries such as automotive, but also other uh, industry manufacturing industries uh, need to find more sustainable and circular solutions when they manufacture and, and uh, design their products. So what would be an example of that? Uh, and I think you, you told me before, you're really focused right in on the drivetrain now of electric vehicles, right? Yeah, right. And, and the reason for that is that the, you want to get as much power as possible um, out of the battery and you want to have as little weight as possible because the battery itself is, is costing energy to, to shuffle it around, right? Yeah. And um, the whole key to, this, to the equation is to get in as early as you can in the process. So when you imagine a new vehicle platform or a new helicopter platform, what are the uh, materials and the metals that you choose in your vehicle? This is where we come in to show you the most sustainable uh, version. So what are the parameters? You mentioned you mentioned weight is, is, is a biggie and I'm sure power density when we're talking battery materials and then the sustainability of the, the manufacturer of those materials? What, are, what other variables or parameters are you optimizing then? Exactly. So the sustainability parameters are several. The one that we look at most here in Europe and in Sweden, for example, is the life cycle assessment. So that is the, the emissions that the, the product produces over its entire lifetime. So every excavator pulling up the metal from the ground and every truck shift driving it to the factory and every factory of course uh, but we also we want to go beyond that not only emissions which emissions is is the biggest problem to to global warming at the moment yeah. but uh, we also want to look at can we reduce the amount of virgin materials and go for more recycled ones or we also look at more uh, less use of water um, but we also don't want to exclude the the s and the esg like the the social aspect so can we find lithium that is coming from mines where child labor is, is forbidden, for example? Okay, that will have a cost effect on my whole product development. How can I account for that on a system level? This is what we try to enable. Right. So who hires you to do that then? So mainly it's uh, OEMs, so the, the, the car manufacturers that are the last ones in the supply chain before the customer uh, receives the vehicle. So these are multinational vehicle developers that choose the components out of the supply chain. So there are several tier ones and tier twos and tier threes where they source all of their components. And those are the ones putting the cars together. And those are the ones effectively making the decision, will I choose a 
recycled um, material or a virgin material. That is where the decision point is. But, but we, don't, we also want to talk to the supply chain to, to find better components out of a sustainability aspect. Right, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a brand new electric vehicle manufacturer and I'm building my platform and I hire you to help me figure out how to optimize between all of these parameters, uh, price and performance and sustainability and social, social governance, all these, all these elements that you've talked about. Exactly, and, and we would tailor it to your strategy and you wouldn't have to be a, a, a machine engineer necessarily. You could have a strategy for volume, then we would probably look at least amount of cost. If you were a uh, high-end uh, race car uh, strategy, we would probably look at maximum torque and maximum high speed. Um, and if you are in uh, a luxury section in your strategy, we would probably look at things like noise vibration reduction and all of those performance parameters and embed the third dimension sustainability, of course, as well. Are, are there, there are several horror, equations here? Yeah. Are there horror stories of, of of examples of companies that have not done this kind of detailed planning, uh, these life cycle assessments, and then after the fact they go, "Oh my God, this was uh, poorly designed. A, a, I, we botched in this regard." Are there? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's um, that's still the status quo, really, in in, in the dialogues we see that you still have a lot of uh, decisions making based on experience, gut feel, and, and uh, maybe even internal politics. Uh, this is very normal in multinational corporations. So, so we strive for putting the data in, in an objective and easily digestible way so that non-engineers can, can throw it up in a decision-making meeting and just find that consensus because it's it's still very much uh, personal driven those those major decisions and million dollar investments uh, in such platforms. So does this 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 software that you de developed? I think it's called EPOP. It's the electrified propulsion optimization process. Right, right. So now that that model has lots and lots of inputs, right? So do you have a staff of people that are constantly researching and figuring out? You know, what are the life cycle input packs of all these different materials? Yeah, we, we really um, don't strive for data ownership or data control, which, which a lot of industry software players will do. That, and, and we have seen examples where it actually slows down the, the development and when people fight about who will own the data. So we, we really only structure your data as a customer. We also do have a library to choose from. Let's say if you are a manufacturer that is a really good on motors and you, you're thinking of which battery should I choose, we have a library you could choose from. Um, we could also, we have programs that design components for you to optimize for your USP, for example. So we really only structure the data that is already out there. And we try to do that with as many players in the industry as possible. This is what we call the common language approach that you as a manufacturer have a, a huge set of data your suppliers will have a lot of data universities and life cycle centers will have life cycle data but because they are very technically advanced data points uh, that go very deep in each discipline you need to find a common language so you can put them together and and make a decision on, on which is the optimum between all three so that's what we try to do right how did you? How did Zbeyond get into this space? Well, it started in in um, electric vehicle engineering, really. So one of our owners, Drive System Design in the UK, developed EPOP to make their life easier as an as an engineering consultancy, where customer asked them, "Help us develop our our powertrain." So. In order to scale, they developed this software as an in-house tool. Then one day the customers told us, could we just keep the tool please and make our own studies? I said, sure, here's a license, but we, we know nothing about software. So let's develop a software company that can focus on the tool and we can focus on being engineers. Um, these guys can build a software for us and, uh, and we can scale with it. Uh, that was one part. The other part was uh, the other owner, who is, who is Hagenas, who's a world leader in materials, has the sustainability data and the know-how 
of what are the effects on magnets if I change to recycled materials, for example. So putting that data again from that supplier in the engineering tool, you have the two components you need to build the next generation uh, propulsion system, material know-how for sustainability and optimum performance. And how can you, is it, I know this is a, it's probably not a fair question, but it, can you, can you actually quantify the benefit? Um, you know, your performance can increase by 25% or the, the sustainability can increase by 25% without effect. Yeah. How do you, how do you quantify that, Victor? So, so I can quantify it in two ways. So one is that we, we put the data together and we're now able to say, if we want a greener vehicle, that's usually something you can just say as a, as a word. We can really put a number on it. Yeah. We can give board of directors the, the data driven, you are 5% behind the competition, or you need another 8% to meet the, the next legislation from, from US or the European Union. Because the worst thing to investors is uncertainty. And if we just say we need a greener vehicles, you need to quantify it. Right. And we can't afford to be like 10 feet ahead of the competition. Just usually want to be like a, a toe ahead. That's right. what we can do. And, and the other example of quantification, usually you have, again, the experience-based designs that are based on two, three, four ideas. So we can scale 10,000 of ideas that synthesize the optimum on the system level. Yeah, yeah. Can you, are there, is there a case study that, that can kind of illustrate how this, how, how this has worked and works for you? Yeah, there are several. I mean, in the last uh, five years, we have had about 20 major projects where we've helped OEMs put vehicles in, into production. And are they, so there are, there most are several. Euro, Europe, most, sorry to interrupt. Are they mostly European projects that you're doing? No, there's actually also a US uh, project ongoing at this moment. Uh, will be one of our first customers okay. as in the new uh, joint venture. Um, but also Europe, but also uh, Korea, uh, Japan, and, and, and companies in, in APEC as well. Okay, I, I, I kind of cut you off there. Continue on with a case study. You said you have about 20 clients going and... Exactly, and, and those case studies are, you already mentioned one, so they could be a, a small EV startup um, that really only wants to, to know benchmarking against the competition or uh, how much more, how much faster does my car have to go. It could be a top three, four OEM in the world that is really focused on the last cost digit. Or it could be OEMs that we have here in Sweden that focus 100% on sustainability and don't really focus on performance or cost at all and say, we're putting a net zero vehicle on the road by 2030. And, and that's really perfect for, for us because it aligns with our strategy to, to accelerate the, the, the transition. But, but it, it could equally be, and there have been case studies with, with a, a helicopter that is EV driven or, or a lawnmower that has to be optimized for for as much power out of the battery. So really anything in, in e-drive uh, would, would qualify that needs to optimize power out of the battery. Now that you mentioned the net zero vehicle in Sweden, there's a goal to have a net zero vehicle. I, I gather that that's not, um, that, that means that all of the embedded materials or all the embedded uh, energy and carbon required to, to manufacture that vehicle, to manufacture that vehicle, the, even the disposal of the vehicle, the, the, the whole life cycle is going to be net zero. Is that right? Exactly. It's a it's a moonshot project, um, and and they they are very dedicated. And um, every step of the life, except for the use case, because as an OEM or a manufacturer, you will not be able to control what energy the consumer is charging in the car. Will it be green or not? You, you cannot say that. But uh, except that little uh, fraction, uh, everything else will be fully net zero. Yeah. And, and th does that mean that, like, for example, in the manufacturing process, that, that the energy, the carbon emissions will be offset? Is that no, how you it will be offset? It will be zero from begin with. No it will be, solar power, it'll be solar powered manufacturer or, or, or wind power, renewably powered manufacturer and then all the way through. Exactly. So I, I'm hoping there will be more, more OEMs doing this. and. And the other thing I'm hoping for is that some OEMs also look at, again, the other aspects of sustainability, like use of land. Do we have to build a new factory? Can we reuse the old ones? Can we, can we use less water? 
and and some of the manufacturing steps. Can we put them in? Model? That's built into your model. Those land use impacts and the water. Use? I mean, in the way that you can um, quickly sweep the space for what happens to my full production cost if I do a new factory or if I'd use any of these five old factories, including the investment cost or the restructuring cost. Yeah. And you could optimize that for what are the logistic routes between the different assembly plants and so on to come to a full system level. Yeah. So you talk to it, you, a client comes to you and then you pretty much lay out all these options. It must be a fun part of your job actually is to figure out what the client wants and then you help them optimize on all those components. It's a very good question because usually these different examples I just mentioned are in different organizations and in different silos in the organization. There is there's almost never, including the, the, the head of the company, who is an expert in all of those disciplines, meaning cost, so profitability, investment, performance, efficiency, sustainability, emissions, where do we we'll place the factories? These are huge organizations in each corporation. So usually we talk to one of these. Usually we start in engineering and then we tell engineering and they say, we really want to use EPUB. They go, okay, maybe we could talk to your sustainability department as well because they are able to use it to use their life cycle assessment in here. And then we have those dialogues. And then we see how it expands inside the company. And that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, but before we talk to each other in those technical disciplines, we won't really manage the transition. You've got all those different silos, all those different viewpoints in a large organization. Somebody's got to make a decision, I guess, at some point. You're, 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 you're showing all the relative costs and benefits of achieving different, different scenarios, I guess. So what we talked a little bit about this when, when I chatted with you a couple of weeks ago. Other sectors that you might be taking this software in, because it's really now you're in a you're you came out of the automotive background. We'll, we'll talk about your background in a minute here, but it, it's primarily focused on electric vehicles, automotive. But then you said anything with a drivetrain, <laughs> you're 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 asked the same questions are being asked. How do you optimize? Exactly. So, so it's twofold. It's it's both what do you optimize, and the second one is, oh hell, we have to uh, change to sustainable materials or fluids. What will that do to my performance or cost base? Yeah. So it could be it could be a, a, a boat. We have boat case studies. It could be a helicopter, but it could equally be a, a chainsaw or a lawnmower, um, but also a heat exchanger, for example. A heat exchanger focuses on getting the most power out of the least amount of energy. It's a, it's a huge market. It has a, a double-digit growth rate for the next 10, 20 years globally. And um, they haven't had to optimize just yet. It's just starting. Um, the, the, next, the next aspect is that all of these components I just mentioned, be it a chainsaw or a lawnmower or a heat exchanger, are increasingly getting smarter as they get more chips and, and people track their the data and the behavior and even control it. And that introduces something that we know from automotive know a lot about. We call that a drive cycle. So an example, the, the performance of an EV will be very different if you drive it in the inner city the whole day or if you plow it down a high, highway coast to coast. The material selection will be very radically different uh, if you want to get as much power out of those two. And in automotive, it's a mix. And each of the cars and the strategy has different drive cycles. And equally, all of these components will be optimized for drive cycles. Right. A heat exchanger will probably drive more at night when the electricity is cheaper. How about we link that in in the database to optimize the design for that performance as well? How would that how would that change the design to optimize on timing? Are you, you got a controller in the heat exchanger then? It would optimize the design in the in the early stage R and D. If the company would say we have a machine here, it needs to on a twenty four basis. It needs to go five hours on a high frequency, four hours on medium frequency, then quickly down to low frequency, and then back up in the morning when the family is waking up, full power. I see. This you could you could optimize for that and balance yeah. the 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 power density or the the use of the power 
in your fluids or in your components yeah. to match that drive cycle, if you will. That's so interesting. What an interesting job. Okay. How did you get into this? <laughs> where, did you, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in, in uh, South Germany, in Heidelberg. Um, beautiful city. I, I, I miss it. But I also know that cities have a tendency to stay where they are. So I'm, I'm happy here in Sweden. But I, I grew up in, in Germany and I've been in Sweden for the past uh, 10 years. All right. So what, what brought you to Sweden then? It was uh, just after I uh, finished my studies in, in Italy, I, I looked for a job in Germany and South Germany, where I'm from. And, and there was a company called Fuchs Lubricants, who's a world leader in, in industrial and automotive fluids. They said, we're opening our branch in Sweden and, and you are a native Swedish speaker. So why don't we put you there to help start that company? So in 2011, I, I packed my bag straight out of university and moved here I had never been here before and and started that company together with my colleagues and it was an amazing journey and after four years the company would purchased uh, statoil and turned the, the the fuel stores into circuit case it was a, a huge project very nice how did you get to the the software and the optimization and that that's not I, i'm not seeing the transition here right i i, the, I understand um, my background is uh, corporate development and, and business control. So I'm, I have, for the past 10 years, facilitated decisions for investors and board members in the automotive industry. Um, so how do I come to the EPOP software? Well, my colleague, Ben Safavi, who's the CTO, is a full-blooded engineer uh, uh, petrol head from the automotive industry. And, and I'm representing the other discipline who needs to look in the tool without an engineering understanding and go, here's 10% value proposition on our sustainability strategy. So what does that do to my CapEx, to my profitability on this strategy? So Benson and me really complement each other in a great way to, to, uh, to take EPOP in, out of the engineering room and into the common language approach. And what, what's, what do you find most rewarding about your your job it's really coming out and meeting a lot of people i've been as i mentioned i've been inside uh, headquarters of large multinational corporations for the past 10 years which is exciting as well um, and you get star stuck and, and and all this meeting all these people inside the company it's so exciting to come out get on the road go to fairs meet customers Sessions like this with you today, it's, it's very um, exploratory, if I call it. And, yeah. and what is unique is, is all this energy in the industry. There's a lot of willpower to make the transition and it opens up for new ideas. And I think it's a very, very unique time. And I'm happy to, to be in this, this uh, time right here in this position, in this age, to, to put in all this energy. So um, I, think, I think in a couple of years, if we, if we manage, we'll, we'll look back at this time. And, and be very excited about how, how yeah. open the market was to change, really. Right. And, and, the, and the growth of EV is just going exponentially at this point. And so it sounds to me, I mean, to sort of put it in lay terms, it sounds like, you know, as there's this explosion of EVs, we need really smart uh, design practices, right? And, and really thoughtful design practices that, that get so that at the core of the EV is, is, a, is a logical system. Yeah, right. Um, and, and with that comment you, you made there, I also want to point out something I, I, it's very important to me that, yes, EVs are growing, but the total number of vehicles is, is declining. So, so we believe in industry that peak, peak car production in the world is behind us. We will, we will never again produce um, the, the 80, 90 million vehicles we produced before COVID. Why? Because cars are getting more efficient, uh, getting more shared concepts. And, and I want to be very clear, no car is still more sustainable than a sustainable car. So, so to really make the transition. And, and um, this is why, why we see also the optimization EV is so important. If you have Ubers driving around automatically in the future, they're going to be driving 24 seven and not stop anymore, but build much less vehicles, which will be better for the environment. So that's why optimization is, is really important. And, and um, 
I, I'm happy to, before I was shocked to hear we'll never build as many cars as we have to because I, I love cars. But, but really, if you think about it, we, less cars is the solution. And, and uh, I'm still not very comfortable saying it, but yes, it is the solution we need. We need less cars, definitely, and, and more efficient ones. Well, I used to, yeah, that's very, very interesting. I used to say, I have been driving EVs now for, I guess, about six years. And I used to say that the best place for my EV is parked at the train station because um, I would right. get my train. But now I think about it, I mean, maybe the best use of my EV would be in a shared pool right where it's 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 a vehicle that can be used um, you know not just 5% of the time or less than 5% of the time but like an uber can be used much in much more uh, can be used more often but that's yeah. fast you make the point about the the peak car production i hadn't heard that i've always heard about peak oil that we're reaching our peak oil and now we're on the decline but what what is this called peak car or, or is it i don't know if it's a if it's a tag and i'm i'm not going to coin the word but i haven't uh, it's basically me and my colleagues who have developed it, looking at the data and, and the mega trends, and, and um, I'm, I'm not sure if it if it is a, a a tribe knowledge yet, but but this is my my indication. Yeah, sure that 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 the peak car is is behind us, and and, and you have and that's just the number of cars, but you actually might have more miles driven in the future with fewer cars, right? Exactly, and they will if they're going the, around the clock and will be shared. They they will be driving much longer and that's also an example that we look at early stage r and right. we don't want to go 200,000 kilometers we need to go a million kilometers so how do we how do we choose the recycled materials to endure longer and be easy to recycle when we decide to i mean that's that's a that's a difficult equation right yeah 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 i guess like a like a commercial airliner you want it in the air as much as possible right you don't want it. You don't want that asset just sitting around, and perhaps our cars will be similar in the future. Exactly, and, and but that's again the interesting aspect that it opens up cross industry. Because another theory I have is that okay, if we, if we don't need to drive everywhere anymore, and the car will be in our car park for ninety percent of the time, and we are putting solar panels on the roof, then I maybe don't need to buy a battery for my house anymore. I could use the car's battery as house battery, and and the car is plugged in, and if the one percent actually do drive it, the house will be fine uh, yeah. without the battery, right? right. Yeah, so that would be another utilization, and suddenly we would have built uh, half the batteries, because batteries is again both king and the biggest challenge with all the lithium and cobalt and, and the heavy virgin materials in there. Right. And yes, we are looking at recycling batteries, and and uh, but but it's very still very very early stage to recycle the full battery. Right. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that vehicle grid integration that you're talking about. I've been looking for my own house. I've got an EV just sitting there with, you know, 65 kilowatt hours and a Tesla power wall is what, around 15 kilowatt hours or something like that. So it's it's a nice asset to have if we can link it together. But yeah, exactly. uh, there's been lots of concern, um, you know, early concerns about that, that you might degrade the battery more by cycling it, it more. But I think a guy like you would say, no, if you got the right materials in there that you can you know, build, design to, um, to avoid degradation. Is that right? Exactly. And that, that's what we tried to do with EPUB, really uh, sweep the space. So we, we, we put in a couple of parameters in, in the tool and, and we let, let EPUB run the study and it will, it will sweep the space for, for the optimum uh, combination of materials in a battery, for example, again, with the drive cycle. So... So some of our customers call it a, a compass, right? In the beginning, where do we start? So, so that's really what what we, we you need you need that broadness um, and still have your experience, but you need to to look way beyond that. Basically, there are so many options out there. Right. It's difficult to manage without software. And to be honest, we have no experience of of EVs. The, the first platforms are just coming out now, and um, it's been five or maximum ten years. So imagine combustion cars it took a hundred years to make them perfectly efficient. They're still not very efficient in some of the continents, but but it's a long process, and we really can say it. The technology is in its cradle. Fascinating. Thanks so much for educating me today. I, I, I it's a fascinating topic, and uh, this optimization is so important as we as we electrify our mobility and and other aspects of our society. So. Great talking to you, Victor. 
Thank you, Ted. It was great. Take care. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's it. Thanks for listening to Flanagan's Ecologic. We'll see you next time.